Hi guys, can you hear me? Um, so before I get started, I want to ask you a question. How many of you work out as much as you want every week? Two hands went up. I believe those people don't have kids, would be my, would be my bet. Um, how many of you have Peloton bikes? Wow, nice hands, welcome. Thanks for your business. Um, so I have uh, uh, 40 pages today. I'm going to get. Tr I'm going to try to get through in 10 minutes. So 15 seconds of slides. So hold on to your seats. I'm going to try to be more dynamic than Tim Kindle. Um, Tim is taller, uh, smarter, stronger, richer than I am. So at least I'm going to try and be more dynamic than he is. If if I can't be, at least I have the mustache, and he doesn't have a mustache. Um, so uh, I'm going to kick things off with how we founded Peloton. Um, this is my wife, these are my kids. Um, like I said, uh, in my 20s and 30s, like a lot of you, I was fit. I went to the gym, I went to yoga, I did Barry's Boot Camp, Soul Cycle Flywheel, did all these things. And then life happens, I'm an entrepreneur, my wife works, and we had two young kids, and it got harder and harder to get to the gym. So I built Peloton, we built with my co-founders, uh, Peloton for ourselves. We wanted this platform, my wife wanted it, I wanted it. We wanted access to fantastic instructor-led boutique fitness classes on our time, on our schedules, at our location, our convenience. We wanted the best seat in the house, the best instructors, all this stuff, so we built Peloton. The first year we launched, uh, the first full year, 2015, we were awarded the best cardio machine on the planet by Men's Health. Um, we did not celebrate this because, to be honest, the bar is very low in fitness equipment. You will go to the gym tomorrow at your hotel or your um, regular gym, and you'll get on a treadmill and you will see dots rotating around a track um, straight out of 1979. There's been almost no innovation in the fitness equipment category for 40 years. So we are the best cardio machine on the planet. Um, who cares? Um, uh, we tripled the size of the company last year. Uh, this year, uh, we told the board we're going to double. Uh, the plan is to do much greater than that. Um, more important than sales is the growing subscriber base. We're a subscription digital content business model. So $39 a month gives you unlimited classes. Um, early next year, we'll be over 250,000 subs. Um, we add subscribers basically as fast as we can make or buy, uh, build and sell bikes. Our uh, monthly retention is over 99%. So we have effectively no churn um, and we have happy customers. More than that, though, is the, uh, the, the best graph we're most proud of is the net promoter score. We believe we're the second highest net promoter score in the world with 91. Um, our entire team of 450 people are focused on us becoming the first company in the world with 100 net promoter score. I'll tell you how we're gonna do that and uniquely how I can even say that because of our vertical integration. We control every touch point of the consumer journey more so than any company that I know of. We'll come back to that in a second. Uh, but quickly I thought I'd do a, a little um, review of the health and wellness category. Um, it's kind of a fun thing. If you haven't read, by the way, Shoe Dog, um, if you're a student of business like I think a lot of you are and like I am, Shoe Dog is a fantastic new book, probably six or eight, nine months old, uh, Phil Knight's uh, autobiography of Nike. But it kind of highlights and puts a, a sharp point on the fact that fitness is a very young category. Fitness effectively wasn't a category in the 60s and early 70s. There was calisthenics. A lot of you remember this if you're old as I am. Um, it wasn't until the late 70s that fitness became a craze, a jogging craze. Some of you remember your parents into it. I was into it. Um, this is Lee, Lee Majors and Farrah Fawcett. This is 1977. Everybody's doing it. Stars joined the jogging craze. So this has happened in our lifetimes. Prior to this, fitness wasn't a category, which is really weird to think about considering how it's part of all of our lives at this point. You think about health and wellness more broadly. Back in the 70s and 80s, when I was growing up, some of you were growing up, um, some of you were being born, um, you drank Coke, you ate Cheetos, you smoked cigarettes. Some of you in the 80s did other things. Um, but uh, it, it was a different world. Health and wellness was not what it is today. Today in New York City, if you drink Diet Coke at lunch, you're going to get a lecture from one of my wife's friends about why it's not good for you. Um, people have changed the way you think about your bodies, you think about health and wellness and fitness. In 2000, there were 33 million Americans with gym memberships. Today, there are uh, 55 million Americans with gym memberships. 55 million Americans paying hard money month after month to access what is now inferior fitness equipment because the Peloton bike is not at your gym yet. <sighs> 
But that's real growth in 15 years. Not only are more people working out, but they're working out more. In 2003, people were working out 40 minutes a week on average. Now they're working out 60 minutes a week on average. That's a 50% increase in just 11 years. At the same time, this is a controversial slide, but I figure I study this stuff like some of you do. Um, when I was growing up in the 70s, um, we were a God-fearing nation. People were religious. You had strong associations with your church or your synagogue or your mosque or whatever you grew up with. Today, in 40 years, there's been a dramatic slide in people's association with organized religion. It's a real thing. I think the onset of the internet, access to information, education, there's been a lot of factors to this. I'm not here to go deep in this, but I think it's a fascinating study of what's happened in our lifetimes. That is not to say that people do not still want that guidance and ritual and identification and community and music and ceremony, spirituality and reflection, that stuff that happened on Sunday morning at church or in your synagogue is still important to human beings, I believe. It's still something humans want, but they're not getting as much of it from their organized religion. People want fitness and they want something else. Inter instructor-led group fitness classes, replete with the candles on the altar and somebody talking to you from a pulpit for 45 minutes. The parallels are uncanny, right? You think about in the 70s and 80s, you'd have a cross on your neck or a Star of David. Now you have a soul cycle tank top. That's your identity, that's your community, that's your religion. It's fascinating stuff, I think it's interesting. Um, what are people getting from that? They're getting guidance. They're getting ritual, identification, community, music, ceremony, spirituality, reflection. They're getting that through instructor-led group fitness classes. It's not just soul cycle. Interestingly, Orange Theory is 10 times bigger than Soul Cycle. I think there's 70 uh, Soul Cycle locations, I think there's 700 Orange Theory locations. CrossFit, guys. 200 times bigger than SoulCycle, CrossFit. So it isn't just this New York City, Upper East Side thing you're hearing about. This is a national thing. Instructor-led group fitness is changing the landscape of society broadly. But what keeps you from doing that? Um, in the 60s, 47% of households had two, two people working. 40 years later, 67% of households have two people working. My wife works, I work, we are busy people. I don't quite believe this slide that 50, only 50% 50 of people check their email on the weekends. I, don't, I want to know what those other 50% of the people are doing. <laughs> but, uh, but people, this always on technology, you guys, everyone in this room are, uh, are the poster children for this, as am I. We are always working. I know um, this, the type of people. Um, but with busier and busier lives, um, working harder and harder, both couples working, it's harder to get to the gym and get that uh, spirituality, get that ritual, get that identification, get that fitness, get those endorphins, get that drug. Whatever you get from your instructor-led group fitness, it's harder to get um, in a busy lifestyle. So we built Peloton. Oh, shoot, two minutes left. Um, Peloton offers more than immersive uh, uh, motivated social workout. Um, we'll get through. <laughs> We'll get, through, we'll get through this fast, because there's some, there's some fun slides coming up. Um, we got the best instructors in the world. There's a flight to quality. Um, we, have, um, we stream 12 hours of live television content uh, a day from our studio here in New York City. Um, we have 7,000 classes on demand, so we're like the Netflix of fitness. Um, but interesting to this crowd, the rest of the thing we'll talk about retail. We have high-end retail stores in 25 mall locations around the country. Um, we are, you know, uh, in the best malls in every city in the market. Um, this is our Palo Alto store. I thought this was a fun one to show. Um, interestingly, we don't just sell our products. We deliver our products. Not many product companies sell you something and then our people show up and set the thing up. We talk to you about the software. We talk to you about the hardware. We talk to you about the content. So I liken it to handsome UPS drivers meets Apple Genius Bar guys coming into your home bringing this 140 pound bike into your bedroom and then explaining the software to you. It's a really unique uh, value prop. Um, so this is this unique, unique vertical integration I talk about. We control the hardware. We make tablet computers better than Apple in my mind, my mind's eye. We make, um, we make the best bikes and we will make other types of uh, fitness equipment in the coming years. 
Um, we write all the client-side software. We write all the cloud-side software. We stream 12 hours of television. We have seven other clouds on demand. We have 26 retail stores, and then we do logistics. We control this entire technology stack in a way that not many companies that you can uh, think about do. Um, we have a crazy engaged community of riders. This is this weekend. This is the Matt Wilpers crew that came in from uh, pilgrimage from all around the country to take a class live with them in the studio. This is the Jen Sherman tribe, where they come in every weekend and meet her, and they've created this real community around Peloton. Um, this is a store event, so not only do we launch the stores, but we tell people in the community that we're launching the store, and people show up to meet the instructors and to engage with the brand. It's a really unique um, platform. I'm, gonna, I'm out of time, but I'm going to keep moving. I'm going to give myself two more minutes. Um, so uh, what is a modern brand? This is something we study. This is something I think you guys would be interested in. Modern brands are guided by purpose, not guided by the market. They have internal culture, not internal structure. This is something that um, the Partners in Spade team is a good agency here in New York City put together. I thought this was brilliant. I think it's fascinating what a modern brand is. Why is uh, Sealy Posturepedic something and Casper something different? Why are those different places in your brain? So it's a st study of brand. Um, the modern brands are empowering, they have marketing built in, not marketing as a layer, and they create a community. These are real interesting things that I study. Um, I thought I couldn't get up here and talk about retail without giving you a little glimpse of what we believe is the most profitable, best stores uh, in the world, even vis-a-vis -vis Apple and Tesla. Um, I put the numbers up here so you can do the math yourself. We have average of 1,200 square foot, uh, or that's what we're going for. We sell about 1,700 bikes. It's a wide variety, but that's the average. Um, $2,500 is the average purchase price because it's a $2,000 bike and you buy other stuff. And then the way I'm doing this math is I'm pulling future subscription revenue. Our churn, again, is effectively nil. It models out to greater than 10 years LTV. So in order to be conservative, I put four, six, and eight years of LTV, and you get crazy uh, profitability in your stores, even vis-a-vis -vis the best brands in the world. Um, real quick, Porter's Five Forces, you think about why you want retail. I think about the bargaining power of buyers and the threats of substitution. You guys study this stuff like I do, Walmart, Costco, and Amazon are starting to lean and take advantage of their size and lean on the brands and compress margins. You guys study this. Um, similarly, threats of substitution. I read an article in the journal a couple days ago. Uh, this Kirkland Signature brand uh, is Costco's uh, white label. They do $120 billion top line at Costco. 25% of it is their own white label product. That is started, if you're, if you're one of these consumer product brands that is pseudo commoditized and you're not studying this and conscious of this and trying to innovate, you are the proverbial frog in the boiling pot of water. Um, this is perhaps the most interesting slide I'm gonna present and it's one of the last. Um, hardware software user experience innovators. Um, these are the companies we study. You guys know these things. Hardware software user experience innovators. Um, Interesting companies, some uh, uh, still relevant, some still good businesses, others not. Um, and then on the other side, you have brands, retailers, direct-to-consumer innovators. So Werby, um, you have Bonobos, you have, trying to click fast, guys, sorry, Casper, um, Harry's, Outdoor Voices, and Shinola. In the middle, there's only a few companies that I can name. So you have the vertically integrated hardware software ex user experience players, and then the brand retail direct consumer innovators. There's only three companies, and you guys can keep your own counsel and try and put some more in here, but I think there's only three that really stand out to me, and it's uh, Apple, Tesla, and Peloton. Um, so back to retail is a critical component for the top uh, consumer products in the world. Um, of these top six companies with the best net promoter scores, Tesla, Peloton, Warby, Bonobos, and Apple all do their own retail. I think controlling the consumer dialogue and touching your consumers and having a voice, having a relationship with them at retail as part of your marketing strategy, of course, multi-channel is the way to go. I'm not espousing retail is the only thing. We sell the majority of our bikes online, but we believe the retail is a critical component for a modern brand that is going to be as disruptive as we plan to be and wants to have a 100 net promoter score. We believe that the, the, the delivery, retail, website, media, the whole enchilada allows you to have a relationship with your customer that is transformative. So that's it. Thank you, guys.